Welcome to Referendum 92. We'll be discussing why vote no on October 26. With us today is Robert Metz with the Freedom Party of Ontario and Don Hemingway with the London Vote No Committee. Welcome. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. Robert, first of all, can you tell us wha what the Freedom Party of Ontario is? Well, we're an officially registered provincial political party that happens to believe that the fundamental purpose of a government in a free society is to protect the individual's freedom of choice. We've been campaigning actively in, in the community on that platform on a number of issues uh, since 1984 when we got started. And uh, this is just an, an ongoing, continuous effort in terms of uh, fighting for the rights of individuals as opposed to group rights, which seems to be the coming trend. And Don, can you tell me what the London Vote No Committee is? The London Vote No Committee was founded just over a month ago um, after the uh, Charlottetown Accord was uh, put forward and the referendum date was settled. Um, there was uh, about 15 people from London from different uh, backgrounds who got together and felt basically that for two reasons, both the uh, process by which the uh, constitutional proposal was arrived at as well as the content, we felt that it was undemocratic and that it should not be uh, accepted and uh, decided to work together on that until October 26th. So you're definitely a very new group to London. Definitely very new. Robert, can you tell me some of the reasons why we should vote no on October Citizens as members of a group and secondly as individual citizens who have equal inalienable rights from coast to coast. So what would happen should the Charlottetown Agreement become reality, and much of it already is reality in Canada, is that we will have a further, further uh, spreading of groups apart from each other, because this is what the whole Charlottetown proposal does. It, it identifies us as French Canadians, as Aboriginal Canadians, as white Anglo-Saxon Canadians, in various groups and forms, which to me is not a formula for unifying a country. If anything, that's the very formula that has brought our country to the brink of disintegration. And now they want to enshrine these, these terrible divisive policies into a constitution, which is like putting a country together on the premise that it will fall apart in the future. And so I think fundamentally that's why I would vote no. So basically the fact that we should be looked at as individuals rather than as groups is your, your biggest sort of argument towards the changes well, in the Constitution? Well, that's the fundamental. I mean, it goes beyond that. When you look at the actual wording, which we'll probably do a little later on, of some of the clauses in the, in the proposals, we can see the, you can see the can of worms that is going to be opened up. So far from being, uh, it's certainly not a final agreement. It is simply a basis on which future negotiations will take place. So for those Canadians who believe that a vote no or yes will put this issue behind them, that is simply not the case. Canada's got a long ways to go in its constitutional um, dealings. And we still haven't got a constitution that works. I don't believe we'll ever have one until we put the individual first and guarantee the individual some basic level of protection from his or her own government. That's what a free country needs to unite it and to give everyone the opportunity to get what they want out of life. Now, Don, why does the London Vote No Committee feel we should vote no on October 26th? Well, there certainly are a lot of reasons for voting no. Um, I would like to mention a couple of them initially. Um, one, first of all, I'd like to talk about the process by which this constitutional agreement was arrived at. And I think um, for myself, this was a, a rather disturbing process. Um, we have the situation where um, 11 first ministers basically behind closed doors arrived at this agreement. If you look at the preface of the agreement, you'll find that it lists a number of meetings that took place, including the Spicer Commission and other consultation that took place with the um, public of Canada. And so we're being told that this was actually quite different than the Meech Lake Accord, where there was this closed door meeting and everything was settled. And, and now this time, people are supposed to have been consulted. I think it's very important that we look at how that consultation process related to the final document that came out. And I think one of the basic problems with the process is that in the uh, consultation process, people raised all sorts of concerns about um, the right of Canadians to have their own say in drafting the Constitution, specifically the question of having a constituent assembly by which this Constitution could be drafted. Um, that was one of the main things that was raised and concern of people that, that they were very distrustful of politicians and the political process itself and wanted some other means of being able to have their say on this constitution. So after those consultations took place, 
then we have come up with this uh, consensus report. And in my opinion, there was no relation between the agenda that the first ministers took up and the concerns that people raised. So in other words, even though all that consultation took place, and I understand that the expense was something like $150 million, that in fact those concerns did not end up in here. Um, so I think that's one very important thing. Um, I also think that uh, the um, attitude of those who are promoting this consensus report in terms of the politicians, um, to suggest that people must agree with this or otherwise there's going to be a serious consequence either economic or the country splitting up and these questions is also a, in my opinion an abuse of, of process because a constitution is the basic fundamental principles on which a country is founded and surely a question that serious requires Canadian people should have the opportunity to discuss it in a very serious way and we're faced with a situation now where most people did not receive this document in their homes until about the 9th or 10th of October and are being told that their decision is so important that if they don't make the right one the country may fall apart and yet we have that mere short period of time to even discuss these questions so there are many other questions um, about the process, but I think it's, it's worth noting that those things, are, I think, are very unacceptable in a, in a democratic society. Um, I would also like to say that in terms of the Constitution itself, I believe that a constitution should come from the people and as I said a constituent assembly or some means of the Canadian people writing and drafting their own constitution. If you look at this document you find that this is exactly not what happened. First you have the 11 ministers drafting the, the uh, constitution, then you have the fact that within the constitution all the various sections which are not settled and as was mentioned there are many many uh, sections of this Constitution that are far from settled and, and all sorts of First Ministers conferences and other consultations still have to take place. Um, but within this Constitution itself, it is in fact the 11 First Ministers rights that are enshrined. If you look at the Canada Clause, the, the basic individual rights of Canadian citizens that, that, that should clarify without any doubt that everyone in Canada is equal before the law with equal rights and duties in this country. It is not there. What is here is the enshrining of the rights of the first ministers. Not only that they drafted this constitution, but if you look at the amending formula to the constitution, it is also they who have the right to amend the constitution. And I feel that this is a, a fundamental flaw for a, a constitution that is befitting modern times and the desire that people have for democratic renewal in Canada and internationally. The other thing I think that is uh, the main other main point um, that I have a very big problem with is the question of the disunity of Canada and I think that that this document in fact is a very big disservice to Canadians in terms of fostering disunity in Canada. I think that uh, if you do not start from the point of all Canadians having equal rights and if you have this hierarchy of rights which is outlined in the Canada Clause that you are not going to be able to solve in a question of unity and certainly not the concerns that uh, the um, uh, people of Quebec have or the concerns that the Aboriginal uh, peoples have as well. Um, I think that uh, the fact that, that provincial powers have been given in large amounts to the provinces, jurisdiction has, has been handed over on whole sections of the economy to the provinces, um, as well as the, the way the Senate has been set up. I think that it means that those um, people who have drafted this, those 11 first ministers, have in fact looked out for the interests of their individual provinces. And the more that we have that kind of situation, the question really keeps coming to my mind, who in these negotiations was speaking for Canada, for Canada as a whole? And I think that's a very big problem with it as well. Now the yes side is saying that if, if we do vote no on October 26, then there's a possibility of splitting up our country. And Prime Minister Mulroney was quoted as saying that a no vote means the beginning of the end of Canada. Robert, I'd like to know what you feel on that. Well, if it weren't such a serious comment, I might laugh at it. The word unity appears but once 
in the whole Charlottetown proposal out of 60 clauses, you'll find the word unity in the heading of the Canada Clause. Nothing within the Charlottetown proposals, there's not a single clause in there that guarantees that Quebec will stay within Confederation, that says that any province indeed will stay within the country, or that even has anything to do with unity at all. What we're getting here is precisely what Don has said. We're getting a document created by politicians for politicians being promoted to Canadians as a unity package when it has nothing whatsoever to do with unity. I find it offensive when that term is used in reference to the Charlottetown proposals because if anyone picks that up and could show me please a line, a sentence anywhere in this document that has anything to do with unity. No, this document defines this country in terms of groups, in particular the Aboriginal groups, the Francophone groups, who get, some of them get more rights than others within the legislative bodies that we're supposedly creating out of this document. The idea that, the, that a Francophone senator can have a double majority and must, upon entering the chamber, declare that he is a Francophone, I find offensive. And I think any Canadian who sees himself as Canadian first should find that very offensive. The idea that if I, as a citizen, could walk from Ontario to Quebec, and I would be subject to a whole different set of laws, that I could go to jail for putting English on my own private property. This is what the Charlottetown proposals would protect. In fact, that's one of the biggest things Quebec wants. Quebec wants the right to continue violating its citizens' rights under the civil code of law, which Quebec operates under. And there, fundamentally, is the conflict we have in Canada. We have this ongoing conflict between the British tradition of common law, where under the British system, the government governs with the consent of those being governed. And every individual is entitled to self-government not just groups, as opposed to the civil law, which is considered a top-down top government in which philosophically we assume that individuals have no rights, but the rights we do have are granted to us from on high from government. And that fundamentally is what our Constitution is. When Pierre Trudeau repatriated our Constitution in 1981-82, he effectively replaced the British system of law, of common law, with the French system of civil law also known as the Napoleonic Code, which is the way some people refer to it. These are fundamentally two opposite systems of government. They cannot coexist under one roof. And if we're talking about unity, remember a community or a nation is a given jurisdiction under which every individual is subject to the same laws, has the same rights, has the same privileges, supposedly should have supposedly the same tax rates, the same obligations across the board then you wouldn't see a conflict between Canadians because they all would know that they're all being treated equally by their government. This is a formula for blatant inequality. It's so clear, it's spelt out blatantly in the document that anyone could hold their head high and support this document I think is shameful. And I think that what we're seeing here right now, the reason we're having this referendum is because like it or not, Canada's in for some tough times. And I think what we see here with the politicians is that they want to shift the blame of what they've done to us over the past 20 years and shift it back on the population. Because you see, the political system wins whether it's a no vote or a yes vote. On the one hand, if we vote no, politicians can say, well, Canada collapsed and everything went wrong because you voted no. We told you to vote yes. You know, you stupid Canadians, you should have listened to us. Right. But if we vote yes, and the country has its problems as it will undoubtedly have and continue to have, then they can say, well, this is what Canadians wanted. We're just doing what the public wanted. So if anyone has to share the blame, it's the public. So you see, they can win both ways on this side of this issue. And that's why we're having this redundant, uh, unnecessary 120 million plus opinion poll being taken, which could just as easily be done by all the regular pollsters who are doing polls every day of the week anyway, to learn the same thing. So what this country's future ultimately depends on is how Canadians may happen to feel at a certain given hour on a day on October 26. I think this is tragic. And I think it, giving Canadians like three weeks to, to look at a 60-clause document, each, each clause of which deserves seven years in Parliament of debate at least, and should be dealt with separately, uh, I think this is a travesty. And I think it just shows how far politicians are willing to go in maintaining their level of control over individuals and making sure that individuals don't have the rightful individual freedom of choice and responsibility that they're entitled to as free citizens. That's what makes a country great, any country. It's freedom. Mm -hmm. 
And looking at uh, Quebec, for example, Premier Borisov feels that the Charlottetown Constitutional Agreement contains major and very important gains for Quebec, which is a, a pretty strong statement coming from someone like um, Borisov. So I would like to know, Don, what you feel in regards to the things set out for Quebec in the Charlottetown Accord, why you are disagreeing with a lot of those um, sort of areas that were talked about within the Constitution. See, I think that on the question of Quebec, um, the concerns that are, that are represented here really are the concerns of the politicians in Quebec, and I don't believe Absolutely. that they are the concerns of the people in Quebec. Um, so you look, for example, um, at uh, the question of what is happening now in the opinion polls, and you see that the people in Quebec, they're not happy with this constitution. It doesn't represent the, th the concerns and the desires and the aspirations that they have. And in fact, I mean, we're seeing the same thing across the country, that, that what is included in here in reference to Quebec does not solve the problems that the people of Quebec have themselves. And so when I hear Brian Mulroney suggest that, you know, that this is the most critical thing, or Orbarasa say that this is the most critical thing, that we are going to be rejecting uh, what the desires of the people of Quebec are, I think to myself, and I look and see what's going on in, in Canada today and realize that these, these amendments that are, are placed in this constitutional proposal, they don't represent what Quebec wants either, because the, the people of Quebec are clearly not lining up in, in support of these amendments. Um, so I think that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the question of Quebec is not settled by this document. and. Uh, I would like to make it clear that from on my own part, I think that Quebec um, is historically a nation and that they have the right to self-determination if that's what they choose. But to try and have something that's called a distinct society, um, which is ill-defined, which in the same clause as it says there's a distinct society, there's another clause that says all provinces are equal, and I, it seems to me this is rather a contradictory statement within, within the Canada Clause, that it just mixes apples and oranges and that it is going to ensure that the question of the unity of the people of this country never finally gets settled. It leaves everything up in the air. And uh, I think that uh, it's not acceptable for the rest of Canada, nor uh, is it acceptable for the people of Quebec. So would you say then that you would disagree with the yes side saying that if we don't vote yes, that Canada will split apart and Quebec will want to go on their merry way? Definitely. In fact, you know, if you look at the way this whole referendum has been set up, in my opinion, the referendum itself has been set up in a most divisive way by the government. Um, when, when it came time to participate in this referendum, um, you had to make a choice. You had to either sign up as a, if you wanted to formally participate according to the referendum legislation, you had to sign up as a yes committee or a no committee. And that's the beginning point. And right. in my opinion, it should have begun with discussion, a very serious discussion with the Canadian people right across the country, not saying from point one, you pick a side. It, it is very, a very divisive process that's been imposed on us, but it's been imposed on us. And uh, now that it has, I think it, it gives us an opportunity. It gives the Canadian people an opportunity to say, we don't agree with the content of this thing, we don't like the process, and even though 11 First Ministers may think it's suitable for the Canadian people, we, we are the Canadian people, and really that's a decision that we are going to make ourselves. And so I think we should take very seriously now the opportunity to have our, our uh, voice heard on this question on the 26th. Would you say it's fair then to say that the, the government almost split Canada right off the bat by saying we had to decide yes or no right away? I think it was a very, de very divisive way to begin this process. Yes, absolutely. What about Aboriginal people's rights? They aren't uh, currently included in our Constitution, and I want to know what you feel should be done about that. Like, you know, the, the, that's another argument on the yes side that we've got to include Aboriginal people, and they're saying that if, we, if this doesn't pass, then they're not going to be included, and it's going to cause more problems. Robert, what well, do you think? Well, again, here's another absolute fabrication coming from the Charlottetown proposals. The, it is being claimed by the yes side that the Charlottetown proposals will give Aboriginal groups self-government. If you read the clauses, it's not what it does at all. It does something very different. In fact, what it does is it commits federal and provincial governments to subsidize financially and with land the Aboriginal governments. 
It forces the Aboriginal governments to undertake things like affirmative action programs and all the various welfare schemes that have already been bringing Canada down, things that we cannot afford. What it basically does is make the native governments completely dependent upon the Canadian and provincial governments, both for their support, their administration. I don't know how, they're, I don't know how they can possibly call this self-government. If you're talking self-government, it means you rule yourself, you tax yourself, you're responsible for yourself. You don't sit there waiting for a handout from a, a, a society outside yours and expect that that society is going to prop you up for long, especially when that society is going bankrupt. So at the same time, we hear this talk about trying to preserve native culture, and I just can't see native culture being the welfare state. I don't think that's what natives were originally all about. I don't think that was what the whole situation has, had intended to be. If people want self-government, everyone in this country should be titled, entitled to it, every individual. I govern myself, and when I pass or, or cross your right to govern yourself, that's when the government steps in to arbitrate a possible dispute. That's the legitimate function of government. So that if, if native groups or francophone groups or Germans, Italians, Asian groups, whatever, if they want the right to self-government, they have it enshrined within this thing that we call individual rights. You know, you don't get more rights just because you join a group. The fact that three of us are here, we could, we could call this a little group, but it doesn't mean we have any more rights than each of us as individuals do. We still have the freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, religion, all those things. How do these things change if we join a group? And this is what the Charlottetown proposals are trying to impose into our Constitution. And you have to realize, when these changes get put into a Constitution, we can't back out of it that easily anymore. This isn't like a piece of legislation or a social program that maybe tomorrow we'll realize was a tragic mistake and we might want to go back on it. To go back on it now, we would have to go through whatever this agreed process for amending the Constitution is all about. And that could be something that drags on for years, causing the country to collapse while it's trying to recover from a mistake it makes. So, you know, we have to realize that why do we need a Constitution in the first place? Ultimately, a Constitution should, should be a citizen's charter against, the, it's, against his own government, in a sense, limiting government power. The government may go this far, but no further. This constitutional proposal, in fact, uses the term and not limited to several times. It outlines all kinds of powers for the government, and including a complete regulation of the economy, trade. I mean, even that, that story they tell us we're going to have free flow of goods and services, this is not true. It is not spelled out in there. In fact, the very opposite is spelled out in the, in the agreement. So we have to be careful in terms of what we're being told by the yes forces. I honestly believe they haven't read this, this proposal yet. I honestly do. Um, and I've always found, too, that when you approach someone from the yes side and just bring a few facts to their, to their uh, attention, that the vote swings around pretty quickly. And I think this is what we've seen happening in Canada over the past couple weeks. I think if it were going to last much longer, I think you'd see 100 percent no on, you know, within two months, go that long. Now, Don, I'm curious about something. Mm -hmm. um, taking a look at, at the Charlottetown Accord, mm -hmm. um, the no side has a very diverse group of, of groups put together and, mm -hmm. and that are talking about all these issues and all the problems with the Constitutional Accord or the Charlottetown Accord. Mm -hmm. I would like to know what you would propose, what your group, if anything, would propose to deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. Do you think something like the Charlottetown Accord is a good thing, but it needs to be changed? Okay. If I can, if I can just sneak in another point about sure. Aboriginal uh, self-government, because I'd really like to, to say that first. Um, I feel very strongly that there's been a, a, a terrible historical wrong done to Native peoples in this country, and I believe that the hereditary rights of Native peoples should be recognized, but I don't believe that this document does it. I believe that this document simply means that there's going to be five more years of negotiations about land claims, that things are going to go to finally to the Supreme Court and all, all sorts of litigation is going to take place and that the fundamental right that Native peoples have is basically not dealt with in here. And I think there's a lot of Native groups across Canada who are now saying precisely the same thing. In terms of what I think the uh, Constitution itself, how we should arrive at it or what it should be, I think a constitution is basic fundamental principles of a country um, which are above any government or any particular politician. In a, these are, represent the sentiments and desires of the people of the country and from those the governments must take direction. These are basic rights, inviolable rights that go beyond any government. Um, I think that 
we as a Canadian citizenry should be the ones who draft this constitution. And so for me, if this, if this proposal um, is defeated on October 26th, um, I think one of the first things that needs to take place is, in my opinion, a, a constituent assembly. Now, there may be other proposals on that question as well, but certainly um, some means of the Canadian people themselves drafting this constitution and enshrining in it the right of the Canadian people to amend the Constitution, because I think this is an extremely important point. We are, in a sense, if we, if we accept this proposal, we are putting ourselves in a constitutional prison and the keys being thrown away. Because if you look at the amending formula, it is going to be extremely difficult to change this uh, proposal if it's accepted on, on the 26th. Robert, uh, putting aside the fact that, that you're on the no side of the committee, what do you think the outcome on October 26th is going to be? Well, that depends on how many people decide to get up and vote, and I think that's going to have more of an effect than how many people have already made up their minds at this point in time. Uh, traditionally, I've found that uh, quite often you may have a, a lot of people on one side of an issue, but for one reason or another, they decide that they're not going to get out and vote. So I would suggest that, you know, I have one positive to th thing to say about this referendum, and only one. And I think it's the first time ever that Canadians have had to pick an idea instead of a personality. And I think fundamentally that's what politics is all about, is ideas and philosophies. So this is your chance to say so. You don't have to vote against any, anyone. You don't have to vote for anyone. You vote against or for an idea. And I think that the question that I'll be asking myself on the 26th is, do I want to live in a country that regards me as one small segment of a larger group? Or do I want to live in a country that regards me as a unique individual, along with all my fellow citizens who are also unique individuals, and who all have equal rights from coast to coast, not a special set of rights or a special government or anything of this nature anywhere in the country? That is what would call, uh, that's how we earn our name a country. That's how mm -hmm. we earn the fact that we're a nation. And so all I could say on that point, expectations aside, I'll be voting no, and that's fundamentally the reason. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Thank you, Don.